Alright, so let's come to the last part of this lecture and this is now kind of a bit of background information that isn't quite as uh, uh, relevant for your everyday programming things, but which I think is still worth knowing about and this is the so-called buffer overflow. Sometimes it's also called a stack overflow. There's a reason why this one very popular question and answer site is called like this, because it's actually one of the most common uh, crashing bugs in programming. And uh, I already mentioned that this isn't something that can happen quite as easily in Java. It can mostly happen in C and C++. However, um, th since these languages are still widely used, um, this is also a very common error that uh, I think you should at least have heard about. So let's assume we have a very simple function which get, uh, is called get name, and of course it also has a storage for uh, 64 bytes of uh, of name. Then it will print a prompt, read in the the name from the terminal, and then print out a message, and that's it. So how does does this look like on the stack? If you remember from a previous part, uh, if we have local variables, then they will get memory on the stack. And so this is represented by this green block. Then we will have a so-called frame pointer, which will point to the uh, uh, actual local variables. And we also have the return address, which will tell the program where to go to, where to jump to uh, after the uh, function has finished. And um, now this get s function is uh, a very old uh, C function, which is simply uh, has the purpose to get a string and will read in characters until it hits a new line. Um, so if you look at the code, uh, it just let me just switch back briefly. If you look at the code, it only gets past the uh, name of the array and it does not check any other conditions. This is a problem. Um, if you're only used to Java, then it's actually a little hard to spot the problem. But uh, in C, the function has no way to actually know about the size of the array now, even if it's specified earlier as 64 bytes. The function itself has no way of knowing. So even if you use it uh, properly, then it will just write uh, whatever text you enter in there and uh, terminate it with the usual null byte. However, um, nothing, absolutely nothing, prevents you in this case from just putting in as much data uh, as you want and uh, obviously also more data than the array can actually hold. Then you can override the frame pointer, the return address, a lot else of the stack um, uh, until, until you get an actual proper stack overflow. But the most important part is that the return address is now overwritten with garbage and uh, the program will crash. And there's quite a number of these functions in C that like get s only get uh, a pointer to the start of the array and don't actually check for any size conditions. Um, and the compiler will by now actually warn you if you ever uh, use this kind of um, this kind of function. And uh, yeah, so what's the problem here? Why is this actually a, a security issue, this sort of bug? Um, the problem is that you can write into the buffer whatever you like, of course, and you can also write machine code in there. So something that the um, the processor can actually execute. And if you know specifically, for example, where the, uh, the stack is going to start and uh, how large the buffer is and so on, then you can actually input machine code in there that will then execute some kind of malicious function. And you can also overwrite this return address if you put in the exact right amount of code. So in this case, it's uh, 72 bytes, basically 64 plus four bytes for the frame pointer plus four bytes for the return address. Um, 72 bytes of which the last ones are exactly designed to now be a pointer back towards the start of this array where you put your uh, your malicious data basically then when the function has finished maybe it will print out garbage or something but when the function has finished it will actually um, 
go back to the, the return address stored here, but since that has just been overwritten, it will actually jump back right into the buffer where now you have the machine code that's actually uh, serving some sort of malicious purpose. And that will then be just executed by uh, the processor as usual. And so this is kind of the root cause of a lot of security issues that you can, first of all, fill some side type of buffer with arbitrary data. And that arbitrary data can also be machine code that the processor would actually uh, be able to execute. Plus you have some uh, kind of control over the return address that will then uh, cause the, um, the processor when the function has finished to jump back into the, uh, into the buffer itself and uh, start executing the machine code. Um, luckily, many modern operating systems actually contain quite a number of countermeasures. So there's a number of strategies to, to mitigate these uh, security issues. Um, that doesn't make it entirely impossible to exploit them, but at least it makes it quite a bit harder. Um, one very simple mitigation is to just randomize the address layout. As you can see in this example, um, we have to know where the uh, stack starts and we have to actually know the exact address of this uh, of this buffer. And uh, so if we're an external attacker, we can't just look at uh, the memory with a debugger. We have to know in advance. And earlier operating systems always used the same layout for their processes and memory. So uh, it was very easy to kind of guess where a specific uh, buffer, for example, would be because you need that information to actually create the correct return address to overwrite here. But if the layout of the memory for each program is randomized and shuffled around, then it gets, suddenly gets a lot more harder, a lot harder to actually uh, find out the correct address, for example, to jump to. Um, another approach is to have a so-called canary, like the, the pro proverbial, proverbial canary in the coal mine, which is a specific um, random value that's been inserted before the return address. And so if you want to overwrite uh, the return address, you also have to overwrite that canary value. Um, and the operating system then inserts additional code into the program that before every return will actually check whether that canary value has remained untouched. And if that is the case, then it will just uh, return to whatever is stored there. But if it's not the case if the canary value has been changed. That means that somebody has tried to overwrite the return address and so therefore the program will just be terminated immediately. Um, that, uh, for that to work, uh, of course, you, uh, the attacker mustn't be able to actually guess or predict the canary value. There are also ways around that, but again, it's one thing that makes it a lot harder. Um, in the last mitigation, that's also very important, which also, however, has to be supported by the hardware actually, is the so-called no execute bit, uh, which tells the processor that uh, this specific segment of memory where that buffer is, um, is actually not supposed to contain any code that's actually, uh, any machine code that can be executed. Um, that means when you try to, uh, cheat by overwriting the return address and then jumping back into that uh, that data buffer, then the processor will simply refuse to execute the machine code because it's in a memory segment that's not supposed to be executable. Um, that if you think back to the memory layer what we discussed earlier, the only memory segment that actually needs to be executable is the text segment, um, which contains the actual machine code of the program. And all the others, uh, heap, stack, um, global variables, data segment, and so on, they must not be executable uh, because that will simply make it harder for attackers to, to insert uh, or inject some kind of malicious machine code that they can then execute.
All right, so this was a bit of background on what a, a buffer or stack overflow actually is. Uh, once again, this is not something that can happen quite as easily in Java, but I think it's still valuable to actually know what's going on behind the scenes when people talk about this kind of um, security issue. All right, so with this, we're done for that topic block. So thanks for listening and see you soon.